near the White House. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. He was You know what I mean? So it may work.
one block you can not block it. So he's not with me 24 seven, you know, he leaves the house and he goes to school, he hangs out with his friends and, you know, he's at the park playing basketball and, you know, so I just, I, I worry about that. But not only that, I think one of the biggest challenges that I have is, you know, he's, he's, he's young, he's only seven years old and I have to tell him about the the serious effects that come with having a peanut allergy and that triggers anxiety in him. And so as a mom, I have to, you know, console him and try to, you know, make him feel like he
Stand like over where they are, supposedly, somewhere over there. So we'll get the casket crossing in front of the van.
like you said, I can you start something and I'll come with you. I don't think we're going to have any rain for the tree this year, which is a little unusual. I mean, you know, knock on wood, right? When, when, is, it, when is the tree coming? Tomorrow? Oh, yeah, it rains every year. That was, uh, oh, it's a, they already put it in the hole? Two years ago.
So if you look.
and then a brilliant Secretary of State. They were they were true partners as well as very, very close friends. The first cabinet appointment was James Baker. <laughs> it shows his interest not only in James Baker, but foreign affairs as well. And there we see President George W. Bush, Laura Bush, Neil, and the rest of the family lining up now. That is Commanding General Michael Howard, the Commanding General of the Washington, D.C. District. He's been in charge of all of these preparations, has been by George W.'s side throughout all the ceremonies, uh, and run with such precision, so beautifully done. Uh, and Martha, this is, you know, this is where the military does its work so well. It's one of our most magnificent civic rituals. You know, George, all of us have sat through so many rituals over the years and watched the military, and I've certainly seen the same rituals uh, in combat zones. It is such an important time to grieve together. It's how the military does it. It is that precision. It is, we will do this together, we will share this grief, and we will move on together. Mark, you see the wear there on the family's face as they were all going by. You know, this has been, they have a, they've had a duty over these last several days as well. And you know, that family is exceptionally close. The Bushes have a huge network of friends throughout the world, and yet ultimately blood is thicker than the water. You know, that, that family is, is as thick as thieves, and this must have taken a real toll on them. The honor guard now coming to the top of the steps. We will hear ruffles and flourishes, hail to the chief. A final procession out of the Capitol for George H.W. Bush.
Bush family now heading to the motorcade, which will start up Pennsylvania Avenue past the White House up to Washington National Cathedral. As we saw that beautiful ceremony here at the Capitol, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the official honor guard uh, as well. Uh, military executing it so well, Michael Duffy, but one of the other things that all presidents share, helping plan their funerals. Yes, George, and it, it begins long before they leave the White House. Uh, very early on in a presidency, the military, U.S. Military District of Washington, the outfit you mentioned earlier, uh, spends time with the president and his family uh, or her family to plan these events. Some of it is dictated by tradition. Um, some of it is up to interpretation by the family as to where they want some of the pieces to take place, uh, who comes. Uh, obviously, and, and down to the details of, of music and prayers. But it, it, it can take a president uh, months to work this out, um, and when they're done, it's usually a set of four or five very large binders uh, uh, ready to go. And of course, the Military District of Washington practices this annually. And I'm struck watching it, George, that you know this is a ritual full of pomp and circumstance that is, as much as it is for George Herbert Walker Bush today, it's really about the presidency itself. It's an office that the founders created and we take care of and nurture and uh, while it's powerful it is also delicate and fragile and it has to um, be minded and this is one of the ways we do it uh, and it's it's quite a public moment for the military uh, as well transcends any individual in the office let's listen to george hw bush talking about planning his funeral almost the minute you become president you are pestered to put into writing your funeral arrangements I wrote this note to Patty Presock, my right-hand person in the Oval Office, to add to my funeral file. June 10, 1991. To Patty. Re my burial instructions. Addenda. I want the song Last Full Measure of Devotion sung by a good male soloist at any church or memorial service. Gravestone. The plain stones we see at Arlington. I would like my Navy number on the back of it. I believe it is 01734464. Also on the stone, in addition to what I already requested, he loved Barbara very much. He got the singer as well. Ronan Tynan will, will sing at the National Cathedral later today. Uh, but that's a reminder as well, Cokie Roberts, of course, the president is going to be buried at, at Texas A&M. These, subject, these plans subject to revision. Completely. I was at Hugh Sidey's funeral, the longtime correspondent here. Hugh Sidey was originally supposed to be one of George Bush's uh, eulogists. And when George Bush stood up at his funeral and gave his eulogy, he said, this is all backwards. He's supposed to be doing this for me. And, uh, and then he said, I'm not going to be able to get through this. And he started to give it, and he said, Doro, you have to finish it. And she because stepped in he, right she there. She stepped in. We see Hillary Clinton there. She'll be, of course, at the service uh, as well. One of the reasons Mark Upton Grove, of course, has to change is that it turned out that President Bush, as we see Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter there as well, Vice President Mike Pence. Um, George H.W. Bush had a long post-presidency, a long and fulfilling one. Yeah, he did. Uh, he left office, of course, in, in 1993 and uh, has come perilously close to death in the last several years. I think what sustained him, George, was family. Um, when I saw him in Kenny Bunkport uh, over the summer, uh, and no one thought he would get to Kenny Bunkport, by the way, let alone back, back to, to Houston, Houston, where he passed away. Um, they talked about how how sustaining his family was, what a bomb it was to him to see family in, in Kenny Bunkport. As we talk about family, David Muir at the National Cathedral, uh, of course, the whole family knew that when they lost Barbara Bush earlier this year, that would be such a blow to the president. They knew it would be a blow, and they also knew that their grandfather likely knew that it would not be long before he was reunited with his beloved Barbara, who, by the way, he met at a Christmas dance uh, before he left to serve in World War II. 
But one of the things that we've heard so much about in these last few days uh, was the remarkable relationship that he had uh, with his grandchildren. Uh, obviously, at 17, uh, eight great-grandchildren. And we learned today uh, that two of his grandchildren, who were really in the public eye, of course, Jenna and Barbara, who grew up in the White House with uh, George W. Bush and their mother, Laura, of course, that they have seen the eulogy uh, that their father will deliver here at the National Cathedral uh, behind me uh, in Washington, uh, and that their father asked them uh, for their input, and they offered some suggestions. Uh, they described uh, that it's difficult to express just how much you love someone, and that will be the real challenge for their father today. They said the other challenge, quite frankly, and uh, you all mentioned that earlier, that this is a family of weepers, and uh, many of us here in this country are grateful they are, but that the other challenge will be for their father to keep it together uh, in front of this cathedral here today. And George, we've, we've seen other people arrive here, President uh, Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, uh, being embraced by Michelle Obama just moments ago, and perhaps this is a, a sort of posthumous service to the country from George Herbert Walker Bush, that he was able to get this moment of unity uh, in such a divided time. So many people here already at the cathedral, George. And we're seeing them right there, Michelle Obama talking to President Bill Clinton, Martha Raddus, and we see President Barack Obama. And just on that issue of family again, uh, George H.W. Bush wrote his greatest accomplishment was that his children still come home. <laughs> <laughs> They come home, he tended to them, he talked about some of the greatest joys in his life, being able to be young again uh, with his grandchildren. Easy, easy scene there in the front row with Barack Obama and Bill Clinton. He'd love to know what the joke is about <laughs> as they're talking. talking. <laughs> and they're both talking, and they're going to talk, talk over uh, each other. Michael Duffy says, as I said, you've written about uh, with former presidents, this club of, of former presidents, they don't get together all that often except for occasions like this. No, I think the last time this many were together, George, was when uh, George Walker Bush invited uh, most of the, all the members of the club to meet Barack Obama uh, early in 2009, and that was for a lunch. Uh, they d didn't talk about Congress or the Middle East or, or how to get a budget through. They talked about what it was like to raise daughters in the White House because <laughs> all of them had tried. <laughs> and uh, they all found it hard um, and frustrating and just like every parent. So uh, that was interesting. Um, uh, uh, Jimmy Carter uh, told me after that session that he, there should have been more to eat, too. Uh, they, they were a little light on food. <laughs> so um, it's, it's, like any, it's just like any club, uh, just a little smaller and harder to get into. And John Carl, President Obama was able to spend just a few minutes with President Bush earlier this week. We're also seeing, before you go, the Supreme Court there uh, right now. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen Breyer, Elena Kagan, Justice Thomas, of course, one of two picks from President Bush to the Supreme Court. He's there on the left. His first, David Souter, chose to retire uh, from the court. He's there. But he's there him. as well. Um, and, and, of course, this is one of the president's most important uh, responsibilities. Everyone now waiting. John Carl, President Trump will soon join that front row. Well, th that's what I'm struck. I'm looking at those former presidents and first ladies, uh, obviously sharing memories of George Herbert Walker Bush, enjoying each other's company. And in, a, in moments, we will see joining that row, Melania and Donald Trump. And you will see Melania Trump will be seated right next to uh, Barack Obama and then on the aisle, uh, President Trump. Um, obviously a very different relationship, George. Uh, but for this day, for this moment, a truce and a moment of unity, a rare moment of unity uh, in, in our deeply divided country uh, to celebrate the life of our oldest, who was until he died, our oldest living past president. Vice President Pence there, I believe. Mm -hmm greeting the Clintons, making his way over. He eulogized the president at the Capitol just the other night, Terry Moran. And it's worth saying, as we await President Trump, that he hasn't put a foot wrong since uh, George Herbert Walker Bush died. Not a false note. He has uh, done what we expect presidents to do, which is represent the nation at this moment, sent Air Force One down there, paid a visit uh, to, to Blair House, had been in contact with the Bush family. It is, uh, it is 
one of his most presidential moments in the traditional sense of that. Despite the fact, Mark Updegrove, we know, you know, he told you what President Bush thought of Donald Trump while he was running for president. <laughs> he did. He said, uh, I don't know him, but I don't like him. And he called him a blowhard. Uh, I think, you know, Donald Trump is, a, is a, a very different person than George Herbert Walker Bush, let alone different in, in terms of temperament and in terms of policy. Uh, and I don't think it sat well with him how Jeb was treated in the camp. But John Carl, one of the things that I think softened President Trump up, and we talked to the president about this just the day uh, before he was inaugurated, a very nice note that George H.W. Bush sent to him after the election. Absolutely. You and I had been on Good Morning America. I had noted that uh, 41 was not going to be attending the inauguration, and I recounted the, uh, the story of him throwing shoes at the television during the campaign when Donald yes. Trump uh, would come on. And uh, we got a call. We got a call from, uh, from President-elect from President Trump uh, telling us about this wonderful note that he had received uh, from, from George H.W. Bush. Uh, a gracious note. He was, you know, obviously somebody loved writing notes, writing letters, and he was explaining that he wouldn't be able to go for, for health reasons. He joked that uh, his doctor had said that if he and, and Barbara uh, had tried to come to the inauguration, they would be six feet under. Um, and then he offered him uh, his support and his best wishes as they began this wonderful journey of being president of the United States, a, a true classically George Bush Grace note. It is a classic move, Mark Updegrove. It that remind me of another letter that, um, uh, that George H.W. Bush wrote after he had criticized uh, Dick Cheney, uh, very tough criticism of, of Dick Cheney, but then he wrote Cheney a letter and said, yeah, I did it. But then made up to him. <laughs> <laughs> Which is characteristic. George Bush. George Bush always made friends uh, after a campaign, after saying something negative. He made friends with Geraldine Ferrara, who he, he was pitted against as, uh, as a vice presidential nominee in, in 1980. He made friends with Michael Dukakis. We had run against him in 80. And of course, Bill Clinton. And of course, he wrote that famous letter to Bill Clinton, left it in the Oval Office. Let's listen to the president talking about that. Ronald Reagan established a tradition among outgoing presidents to, to leave a handwritten note for their successors. When you arrived back to the White House in the Oval Office after becoming president, you found in the iconic Resolute desk in the, in the Oval Office a handwritten note from George Bush. Mr. President, I wonder, would you mind reading a part of that note? Yeah, I, I love that, that letter. Bold here. It said, uh, <clears throat> I wish you great happiness here. There will be tough times made even more difficult by criticism you may not think is fair. I'm not a very good one to give advice, but just don't let the critics discourage you or push you off course. You will be our president when you read this note. I wish you well. I wish our, your family well. Your success is our country's success. I'm rooting hard for you. How did you feel when you received that letter? I thought it was vintage George Bush. I thought he meant it, but I also thought he was trying to be a citizen in the highest sense of the word. Mm -hmm. It was profoundly moving to me personally. Especially Donna Brazil, that last line, your success is our country's success. I mean, George, we have, uh, we have 50 governors, we have 435 members in the House, 100 United States senators, but we have one president. And George Herbert Walker Bush knew that, and he understood that the role of the presidency is one of a unifier uh, and one who tries to bring the country together. And leaving that note, I think, meant a lot to Bill Clinton. There is no question about that, Cokie Roberts. They also ended up working together, not only in the post-presidency, but during uh, the days in the White House, working together on issues like NAFTA and others. He was determined to make good on his words. He was Bush. absolutely determined, and uh, and that you know that made a lot of difference because people, things got done. You know that's how things get done. But you know I got I'm uh, very pleased that I have a couple of notes from George Bush, the famous letter writer, and. Um, and they're just so wonderfully, even even the note, uh, the sympathy note when my mother died was so upbeat. And, uh, and you could just sort of see him smiling as he wrote them. And the last one I got from him was last year, and he said, the Bushes are doing fine. I hope your family is too. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 Go ahead, Martha. George, George, there's all this talk today about being your authentic self. I'm not sure what that really means. <laughs> but George H.W. Bush was always his authentic yeah. self, sometimes a little off 
awkward, sometimes <laughs> not. But if he wrote you a note like that, he meant it. Right. Mm -hmm. And he meant what he said to Bill Clinton. It wasn't just part of his duty uh, at passing the presidential uh, to to uh, Bill Clinton. That's who he and, was. And, and, and Terry, in the language, he, he, so eloquent in those letters, also so much a man of his time. I'm thinking of a couple letters. He wrote one to his granddaughter saying, oh, darn. That was the first one. <laughs> Once wrote Audrey Hepburn after she won an Oscar yeah. saying, you're the meowest of the cats. Straight out of 1945, right? You can take the end over, the boy out of Andover, but you can take the end over out of the boy. But it's also, President Clinton said there, uh, citizenship. And citizenship is a, is a discipline. You have to practice it. Kindness right. mm -hmm. is a discipline mm -hmm. of character, mm -hmm. of the spirit. And every day, he, he practiced those things until he got really good at them. It's a really good lesson. Uh, for everybody else, you know, you you can choose to be happy, you can choose to be a fine citizen, uh, and then you go out and do it. And that was one of the things his granddaughter Barbara talked about. She spent a lot of time with him this summer up in Kennebunkport, Mark uh, Mark Updegrove, and she talked about even in his darkest days, even as he was declining, he was always grateful and always looking for those moments of happiness. He in was the full of unbridled optimism right. Right. and vitality. He loved. Life. I think that's what kept him going uh, after his wife Barbara passed, his beloved Barbara passed. But, but think of all that he had been through. Mm -hmm. During yeah. World War II, he survived and so many didn't. Mm -hmm. And there is often that survivor's guilt, but there is often people who make it through something like that. They never forget the value of life. He also, let's remember, lost his three-year-old daughter, Robin, he and Barbara, yeah. which was so painful to them. Such an important point. I want to bring that to Michael Duffy as well. I remember, uh, famous, you covered the Bush campaign, I think it was back in 1988, talking about fighting the wimp factor. But when you look at his history, right. an extraordinarily mm -hmm. tough man. Oh, the charge must have just galled him. Um, and he was not, he had a determination and a doggedness that sometimes you couldn't see beneath that patrician you know, uh, upper class breeding that he had. Underneath was a real fighter, a deeply competitive man who not only played baseball in college, but also made the soccer team as a freshman in college. I mean, he wanted to be the best in a lot of different fields. I, I think the other thing that's just worth mentioning about him today, since it's, we're, we're doing some appreciations, um, he, this is a man who had a keen sense of fun. Uh, he was a great practical joker. Uh, he loved to do gags. Um, I remember once I was doing a story about how he decided, you know, how he made decisions. And he thought this was such a hysterical idea for a story. He gathered his staff at his yes. desk around him, hovering over a crystal ball, had the picture <laughs> taken and said, this is how I make decisions, and <laughs> sent it to me. And, I mean, it took me two weeks to figure out what to do next. <laughs> Coke, I'm going to put you on the spot with another story you were telling me. Uh, the other day about Barbara and him and a little... <laughs> well, so uh, this is a story told by his granddaughter, Ellie LeBlanc, uh, that uh, at one point her mother, Dora, was given a whoopee cushion. <laughs> and uh, and Dora thought that, that her father would love it. So she brings it to Kennebunkport, and the whole family's there, and they sit at dinner, and they all sort of pass it around the table. And um, finally it ends up with the president. And uh, as Mrs. Bush is getting up, Barbara, to, to leave, he sits on it, and she, you know, and everybody laughs, and she walks out of the room and just gives him a slap and says, grow up, George. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was talking to a couple of the granddaughters the other day, Mark Upton Grove. He did have a goofy side. Oh, yeah, right. he definitely totally. had a goofy side. He said in, in, at the end of 1990, uh, one of his young grandchildren came into the Oval Office uh, and, and took him over to a bathroom where there was an unflushed toilet, and she said, Grandpa, did you leave this poo-poo in the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> he said it was one of the highlights of the year. <laughs> Not a word I thought we'd be saying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry we've, got, we've gone into <laughs> brand new territory. <laughs> brand new, but it, it, it shows every single side uh, of the man and Martha Raddatz. And, uh, George, I, I remember up in Kennebunkport because I covered uh, George W. Bush after, after Terry did. And we were in Kennebunkport in 2007 when Vladimir Putin uh, came to visit. And George H.W. Bush had him stay there for a couple of days. And what President Bush did, uh, 41, is take him out in his speedboat. Right. And, at, go as and, you know, we were all up there on the ledge, and you could see those speedboats going by <laughs> as fast as possible. And uh, the president loved scaring the interpreter. Speedboat, speed golf. Well, another side of him, one night uh, we were at a gala for Save the Children, and he was very kind to come. 
And uh, at our, I was seated next to him, and at our table was Blythe Danner. He really wanted to sit next to Blythe Danner. <laughs> Back inside the cathedral right there, President Bush, the First Lady Melania, President Trump, First Lady Melania Trump, now entering as the motorcade makes its way towards the cathedral. President Trump went by Blair House to greet the family, also paid his respects at the Capitol Rotunda. President's now in place. Every living American president with George W. Bush on the other side when he arrives to honor our 41st president. Vice President's in the second row. Mark Updegrove, again, just that picture right there tells you, tells the story of trying to bring our country together, at least for one day. You see the continuity of government there. You see our history right there in that front pew. And it occurs to me, George, the one person we don't see, of course, is George W. Bush, who will eulogize his father. But the most indelible moment both men had of each other, Bush 41 and Bush 43, was during the memorial service for 9-11, which was held on the 14th of September in 2001. And uh, George W. Bush made a very emotional speech uh, and a, a beautiful, magnificent speech. Came back to his pew and his father reached over and he took his hand. And it was an incredibly stirring moment. I can't imagine that George W. Bush is not thinking of that today. That was the scene right there. Of course, the through line after 9-11, George W. Bush took American troops into Iraq again. His father, back in 1991, had chosen not to go in Iraq after driving Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. Terry Moran, both presidents faced questions about that time and time again. And it was partly the, the lesson that President George W. Bush took uh, from the first Gulf War and that his advisors, Dick Cheney and others, did that they hadn't finished the job that Saddam Hussein was a, a threat in that part of the world and that it, after 9-11 he had to be taken care of. It may turn out to be one of the great strategic mistakes, but it was partly an echo of his father's decision not to go. And so difficult, Mark, up to grow for President George H.W. Bush as he was watching his son, he didn't want to get involved in any way. No, he was hands off. He knew firsthand the burdens of the Oval Office. He didn't want to put undue burden on his son by, by weighing in, by adding his voice. And he would also concede that the world had changed since he was president. He trusted his, fun, his son to, to find the right balance in policy. But he also felt strongly, and again said this in this interview with me about the Constitution, that he had gone to the UN, he had a resolution. The resolution said, get Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And he went to the Congress and he got a vote from Congress saying the same thing. And he felt that to go beyond that was to lie. And that was the word he used. I do not want to lie to the Congress. I did not want to lie to the UN. I did what I was supposed to do. Martha Redd, it's two wars, two very different outcomes. Two very different outcomes. And of course, George W. Bush thought the war in Iraq would be over quickly, uh, that we would invade and be out of there. It dogged his presidency. I think I spent more time over there than I did actually in the White House. But we used to talk about it quite a bit. And, and let's I... listen to father and son reflecting on the presidency. I remember the first time I went to the Oval Office as president, I was uh, in awe. And after I got there, uh, I had a guest, and that was President 41. I was in the bathtub at the White House residence, and Ramsey, a guy that worked there, came in and said, get out of that bathtub, your son is over in the Oval Office. As I recall, the conversation went something like this. Welcome, Mr. President. It's good to see you, Mr. President. 
And that's all we said. It was fun just walking in and seeing your own son be the president of the United States. And I remember uh, visiting Dad in the Oval Office when he was president and how much reverence he treated the office. Uh, and I tried to do the same thing. I mean, the Oval Office is a place where you make decisions and welcome dignitaries and welcome some friends. But it's a place that always has to be treated with respect and dignity. And we see Jimmy Carter, of course, also held the office. Mark Updegrove, I'm thinking of uh, a letter that the president wrote to Prime Minister Brian Mulroney of Canada, who will speak today. At the day that George W. Bush was elected, he said, it was like a new day had dawned for our families. Think about it, one family, 12 years in the White House. Oh, it's amazing. It's, it's a remarkable story. And, of course, George H.W. Bush had been in the vice presidency for eight years under, under Ronald Reagan. So you have full 20 years in the White House for one family. That, that is remarkable. As we see the motorcade now approaching the National Cathedral, it is the highest point in Washington. The National Cathedral also for so many years, the home parish for George H.W. Bush, the Naval Observatory Vice President's residence, just a few blocks from there. His children went to St. Albans. He was on the board of the National Cathedral School. His grandchild baptized there. David Muir there at the National Cathedral. This is a time when our secular, our spiritual worlds are coming together, also the personal world of George H.W. Bush. Oh, there's no question about that, George. And as you know, it is just a stunning a place of worship, the National Cathedral here in Washington. And as we've been watching these images play out uh, in that front row there, the living presidents, uh, President Trump arriving a short time ago, as you pointed out, and what the president uh, has done uh, for the Bush family, despite tension during the campaign and sending one of the two planes that function as Air Force One down to Texas to bring George H.W. Uh, Bush back to Washington one final time. Uh, of course, the Obamas are here, and they have famously said uh, since his death that both he and Barbara are two points of light that have never dimmed, hearkening back to that speech he gave, asking for a thousand points of light across this country for community service, and you can see the Obamas sitting there in the front row. The Clintons uh, next to the Obamas, and we've been watching all of these uh, Former presidents talk with one another, the first ladies talk with one another, and Bill Clinton has said in recent days that it's a friendship that he will consider one of the greatest gifts of his life as we look at the car carrying the body of President George H.W. Bush to the National Cathedral and where all of the living presidents and former first ladies will pay tribute to a man, as Jimmy and Rosalind Carter said, was a man with social conscience, of civility, and who showed remarkable grace in front of this country. The motorcade has now reached National Cathedral. The funeral service will be conducted by the Reverend Dr. Russell Levinson of the National Cathedral of the St. Martin's Episcopal Church in Houston with participation from the rector of the National Cathedral as well. The President's casket will be met by the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, and Most Reverend Michael Bruce Curry. And Marion Edgar Buddy, the bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington.
you see the honor guard. The family will be escorted inside uh, the cathedral. And David, they will be taking their place of honor there at the front for the Bush family. They will, and we can see uh, former President George W. Bush. And I don't think we can overstate what he's about to do. His job is the most difficult on this day. All of the living presidents are here, including him, of course. But he has the job of not only a former president, but a son getting up in front of this cathedral and in front of this nation to share his love for a father and a relationship that was analyzed for many years when you have a father and son who both serve as president and it was only in later years after both were done serving their terms in the White House did they truly share a very public love for one another but you can see the pain on his face through the window of the vehicle just as we've seen from that first day in Washington, George, you and I were on the air talking about the sun setting and he and Laura standing next to each other as the casket was carried up the stairs of the rotunda. And you could read uh, Laura's lips when she turned to her husband and said, what a beautiful day in Washington. The country only is with this family today. Cokie Roberts, only one other president succeeded his father in office, John Quincy Adams, but he couldn't be at his father's funeral. No, uh, it was it was a hard time to travel. <laughs> he couldn't be at his mother's either, but he wrote in his diary that he couldn't imagine the world without her and that he couldn't imagine how his father would survive without his mother, exactly what the Bushes said. As we see George W. Bush next to the car now, along with General Howard, will make his way in, Martha Raddatz. As I look at this and I see President Bush and we were talking about the Iraq War and looking around, there are about 4,000 members of the military who have put this funeral together. You see the Special Honor Guard is the Joint, the joint Chiefs, all of them in battle in some way or another. But George Bush, since that war, has done so much for veterans, has done so much for the military. It has consumed him every time I've seen him since he left office. Has those famous rides, those, those cross-country bicycle rides to raise funds for veterans and also to have them participate. And his the family now gathering.
with faith in Jesus Christ, we receive the body of our brother George for burial. Let us pray with confidence to God, the giver of life, that he will raise them to perfection in the company of saints. Deliver your servant, George, sovereign Lord Christ, from all evil and set him free from every bond that he may rest with all your saints in the eternal habitations where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray also for all who mourn, that they may cast their care on God and know the consolation of his love. Almighty God, look with pity upon the sorrow of your servants for whom we pray. Remember them, gracious God, in mercy. Nourish them with patience. Comfort them with a sense of your goodness. Lift your countenance upon them and give them peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Cathedral Choir, with my house shall be called a house of prayer, and the President's brother, Jonathan Bush. You'll hear now from the Reverend Dr. Russell Levinson, who is President Bush's pastor in Houston, St. Martin's Episcopal Church.
He said that in his final days, President Bush was comforted by the fact he believed that he would be joining his wife, Barbara, and daughter, Robin, who died so young. President Bush and Laura now enter the cathedral. Along with Jeb, Neil, Dora, and Marvin, the President's sons and living daughter. All the living American presidents right there.
I am the resurrection and I am the life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life, even though he die. And everyone who has life and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up, and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see, and my eyes behold him, who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us liveth to himself, and none becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord. And if we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it says, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors.
you? Let us pray. O God, whose mercies cannot be numbered, accept our prayers on behalf of your servant George and grant him an entrance into the land of light and joy in the fellowship of your saints. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First reading now will be from two of the president's granddaughters, Lauren Bush and Ashley Walker Bush. reading from the prophet Isaiah. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and a thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you and the wealth of the nations shall come to you. Violence shall no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun shall no longer be your light by day nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you by night. But the Lord will be your everlasting light and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down or your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light and your days of mourning shall be ended. The word of the Lord. And now the first eulogy of this service will come from John Meacham, President's biographer and longtime friend. worked on this for many years, said he finished a draft two years ago with a few more revisions last night. The story was almost over, even before it had fully begun. Shortly after dawn on Saturday, September 2nd, 1944, Lieutenant Junior Gray George Herbert Walker Bush, joined by two crewmates, took off from the USS San Jacinto to attack a radio tower on Chichijima. As they approached the target, the air was heavy with flak. The plane was hit. Smoke filled the cockpit. Flames raced across the wings. My God, Lieutenant Bush thought, this thing's gonna go down. Yet he kept the plane in its 35-degree dive, dropped his bombs, 
and then roared off out to sea, telling his crewmates to hit the silk. Following protocol, Lieutenant Bush turned the plane so they could bail out. Only then did Bush parachute from the cockpit. The wind propelled him backward, and he gashed his head on the tail of the plane as he flew through the sky. He plunged deep into the ocean, bobbed to the surface, and flopped onto a tiny raft. His head bleeding, his eyes burning, his mouth and throat raw from salt water, the future 41st President of the United States was alone. Sensing that his men had not made it, he was overcome. He felt the weight of responsibility as a nearly physical burden, and he wept. Then, at four minutes shy of noon, a submarine emerged to rescue the downed pilot. George Herbert Walker Bush was safe. The story, his story and ours, would go on by God's grace. Through the ensuing decades, President Bush would frequently ask, nearly daily, he'd ask himself, why me? Why was I spared? And in a sense, the rest of his life was a perennial effort to prove himself worthy of his salvation on that distant morning. To him, his life was no longer his own. There were always more missions to undertake, more lives to touch, and more love to give. And what a headlong race he made of it all. He never slowed down. On the primary campaign trail in New Hampshire once, he grabbed the hand of a department store mannequin asking for votes. When he realized his mistake, he said, never know, gotta ask. <laughs> you can hear the voice, can't you? As Dana Carvey said, the key to a Bush 41 impersonation is Mr. Rogers trying to be John Wayne. <laughs> George Herbert Walker Bush was America's last great soldier statesman, a 20th century founding father. He governed with virtues that most closely resemble those of Washington and of Adams, of TR and of FDR, of Truman and of Eisenhower, of men who believed in causes larger than themselves. Six foot two, handsome, dominant in person, President Bush spoke with those big strong hands, making fists to underscore points. A master of what Franklin Roosevelt called the science of human relationships, he believed that to whom much was given, much is expected. And because life gave him so much, he gave back again and again and again. He stood in the breach in the Cold War against totalitarianism. He stood in the breach in Washington against unthinking partisanship. He stood in the breach against tyranny and discrimination, and on his watch, a wall fell in Berlin. A dictator's aggression did not stand, and doors across America opened to those with disabilities. And in his personal life, he stood in the breach against heartbreak and hurt always offering an outstretched hand, a warm word, a sympathetic tear. If you were down, he would rush to lift you up. And if you were soaring, 
he would rush to savor your success. Strong and gracious, comforting and charming, loving and loyal, he was our shield in danger's hour. Now, of course, there was ambition too, loads of that. To serve, he had to succeed. To preside, he had to prevail. Politics, he once admitted, isn't a pure undertaking. Not if you want to win, it's not. An imperfect man, he left us a more perfect union. It must be said that for a keenly intelligent statesman of stirring, almost unparalleled private eloquence, public speaking was not exactly a strong suit. Fluency in English, President Bush once remarked, is something that I'm often not accused of. <laughs> Looking ahead to the 88 election, he observed, inarguably, it's no exaggeration to say that the undecideds could go one way or the other. <laughs> and late in his presidency, he allowed that we're enjoying sluggish times, but we're not enjoying them very much. <laughs> his tongue may have run amok at moments, but his heart was steadfast. His life code, as he said, was tell the truth, don't blame people, be strong, do your best, try hard, forgive, stay the course. And that was and is the most American of creeds. Abraham Lincoln's better angels of our nature and George H.W. Bush's thousand points of light our companion verses in America's national hymn. For Lincoln and Bush both called on us to choose the right over the convenient, to hope rather than to fear, and to heed not our worst impulses, but our best instincts. In this work, he had the most wonderful of allies in Barbara Pierce Bush, his wife of 73 years. He called her Barr, the Silver Fox, and when the situation warranted, the Enforcer. He was the only boy she ever kissed. Her children, Mrs. Bush liked to say, always wanted to throw up when they heard that. In a letter to Barbara during the war, young George H.W. Bush had written, I love you, precious, with all my heart, and to know that you love me means my life. How lucky our children will be to have a mother like you. And as they will tell you, they surely were. As Vice President, Bush once visited a children's leukemia ward in Krakow. Thirty-five years before, he and Barbara had lost a daughter, Robin, to the disease. In Krakow, a small boy wanted to greet the American Vice President. Learning that the child was sick with the cancer that had taken Robin, Bush began to cry. To his diary later that day, the Vice President said this, my eyes flooded with tears and behind me was a bank of television cameras. And I thought, I can't turn around. I can't dissolve because of personal tragedy in the face of the nurses that give of themselves every day. So I stood there looking at this little guy, tears running down my cheek, hoping he wouldn't see. But if he did, hoping he'd feel that I loved him. That was the real George H.W. Bush, a loving man with a big, vibrant 
all-enveloping heart. And so we ask as we commend his soul to God, and as he did, why him? Why was he spared? The workings of providence are mysterious, but this much is clear. The George Herbert Walker Bush, who survived that fiery fall into the waters of the Pacific three quarters of a century ago, made our lives and the lives of nations freer, better, warmer, and nobler. That was his mission. That was his heartbeat. And if we listen closely enough, we can hear that heartbeat even now, for it's the heartbeat of a lion, a lion who not only led us, but who loved us. That's why him, that's why he was spared. You saw the reaction from the Bush family there to the eulogy from John Meacham answering the question that he said haunted George H.W. Bush his entire life.
reading from Revelation to St. John. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things and I will be their God and they will be my children. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and the lamp is the lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. The word of the Lord. The president's granddaughter, Jenna Bush Hager, and now the second eulogy from the president's longtime friend, former Prime Minister of Canada, Brian Mulroney. Do you remember where you were the summer you left your teenage years behind and turned 20? Well, I was working as a laborer in my hometown in northern Quebec, trying to make enough money to get back into law school. It was a tough job, but I was safe and secure and had the added benefit of my mother's home cooking every night. On September 2nd, 1944, as we have just heard so eloquently from John, 20-year-old Lieutenant George Bush was preparing to attack Japanese war installations in the Pacific. He was part of a courageous generation of young Americans who led the charge against overwhelming odds in the historic and bloody battle for supremacy in the Pacific against the colossal military might of Imperial Japan. That's what George Bush did the summer he turned 20. <laughs> many men of differing talents and skills have served as president, and many more will do so as the decades unfold, bringing new strength and glory to these United States of America. And 50 or 100 years from now, as historians review the accomplishments and the context of all who have served as president, I believe it will be said that in the life of this country, the United States, which is, in my judgment, the greatest democratic republic that God has ever placed on the face of this earth, I believe it will be said that no occupant of the Oval Office was more courageous, more principled, and more honorable than George Herbert Walker Bush. George Bush was a man of high accomplishment, 
but he also had a delightful sense of humor and was a lot of fun. At his first NATO meeting in Brussels, as the new American president, he sat opposite me, actually, that day. George was taking copious notes as the heads of government spoke. We were all limited in time. But you know, it's very flattering to have the President of the United States take notes as you speak. And even someone as modest as me <laughs> threw in a few more adjectives here and there to extend the pleasure of the experience. <laughs> After President Mitterrand, Prime Minister Thatcher, and Chancellor Kohl had spoken, it was tur the turn of the Prime Minister of Iceland who, as President Bush continued to write, went on and on and on and on, ending only when the Secretary General of NATO firmly decreed a coffee break. George put down his pen, walked over to me and said, Brian, I've just learned the fundamental principle of international affairs. I said, what's that, George? He said, the smaller the country, the longer the speech. <laughs> In the second year of the Bush presidency, responding to implacable pressures from the Reagan and Bush administrations, the Soviet Union imploded. This was, in my judgment, the most epical event, political event, of the 20th century. An ominous situation that could have become extremely menacing to world security was instead deftly challenged by the leadership of President Bush into the broad and powerful currents of freedom, providing the Russian people with the opportunity to build an embryonic democracy in a country that had been ruled by czars and tyrants for over a thousand years. And then, as the Berlin Wall collapsed soon thereafter, and calls for freedom cascaded across Central and Eastern Europe, leaving dictators and dogma in the trash can of history, no challenge, no challenge, assumed greater importance for Western solidarity than the unification of Germany within an unswerving NATO. But old fears in Western Europe and unrelenting hostility by the military establishment in the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact rendered this initiative among the most complex and sensitive ever undertaken. One serious misstep and this entire process could have been compromised, perhaps irretrievably. There's obviously no more knowledgeable or competent judge what really happened at this most vital juncture of the 20th century than Chancellor Helmut Kohl of, of Germany. In a speech to a parliamentary commission of the Bundestag, Chancellor Kohl said categorically that this historic initiative of German reunification could never, ever have succeeded without the brilliant leadership of President Bush. Much has been written about the first Gulf War. Simply put, the coalition of 29 disparate nations assembled under the aegis of the United Nations, including for the first time many influential Arab countries and led by the United States, will rank with the most spectacular and successful international initiatives ever undertaken in modern history, designed to punish an aggressor, defend the cause of freedom, and ensure order in a region that had seen too much of the opposite for far too long. This was President Bush's initiative from beginning to end. President Bush was also responsible for the North American Free Trade Agreement, recently modernized and improved by new administrations, which created the largest and richest free trade area in the history of the world while also signing into law the Americans with Disabilities Act, 
which transform the lives of millions and millions of Americans forever. President Bush's decision to go forward with strong environmental legislation, including the Clean Air Act, that resulted in the Acid Rain Accord with Canada, is a splendid gift to future generations of Americans and Canadians to savor in the air they breathe and the water they drink, and the forests they enjoy, and the lakes, rivers, and streams they cherish. There's a word for this. It's called leadership. Leadership. And let me tell you that when George Bush was President of the United States of America, every single head of government in the world knew that they were dealing with a gentleman, a genuine leader, one who was distinguished, resolute, and brave. I don't keep a diary, but occasionally I write private notes after important personal or professional events. One occurred at Walker's Point in Kennebunkport, Maine, on September 2nd, 2001. Mila and I had been spending our traditional Labor Day weekend with George and Barbara. And towards the end, he and I had a long private conversation. My notes capture the moment. I told George how I thought his mood had shifted over the last eight years from a series of frustrations and moments of despondency in 1993 to the high enthusiasm that I felt at the Houston launch of the Presidential Library and George W.'s election as governor in November of that year to the delight following Jeb's election in 1998, followed by their great pride and pleasure with George W.'s election to the presidency and perhaps most importantly, to the serenity we found today in both Barbara and George. They are truly at peace with themselves, joyous in what they and the children have achieved, gratified by the goodness that God has bestowed upon them all, and genuinely content with the thrill and promise of each passing day. And at that, George, who had tears in his eyes as I spoke, said, you know, Brian, you've got us pegged just right. And the roller coaster of emotions we've experienced since 1992. Come with me. He led me down the porch at Walker's Point to the side of the house that fronts the ocean and pointed to a small, simple plaque that had been unobtrusively installed just some days earlier. It read C-A-V-U. George said, Brian, this stands for Ceiling and Visibility Unlimited. When I was a terrified 18 to 19-year-old pilot in the Pacific, those, those were the words we hoped to hear before takeoff. It meant perfect flying. And that's the way I feel about our life today. C-A-V-U. Everything is perfect. Barr and I could not have asked for better lives. We are truly happy and truly at peace. As I looked over the waters of Walker's Point on that golden September afternoon in Maine, I was reminded of the lines, simple and true, that speak to the real nature of George Bush and his love of his wonderful family and precious surroundings. There are wooden ships, there are sailing ships, there are ships that sail the sea, but the best ships are friendships and may they always be. Former Prime Minister of Canada, Brian Mulroney, remembering his friend, George H.W. Bush. Next tribute from another friend, 
former Senator Alan Simpson. He first met President Bush back in 1962 when his father, new Senator from Wyoming, took over the office of Senator Prescott Bush, George H.W. Bush's father. Senator Alan Simpson. Relax, George told me I only had 10 minutes. <laughs> he was very direct about it. It wasn't even funny. <laughs> now, I first met my friend, my dear friend, George Bush, in 1962, when my father, Millward Simpson, was a member of the United States Senate, just elected. And I came back to Washington with Dad to settle on his new office being vacated by one Senator Prescott Bush, George's father. Well, then we met again when my parents left Washington and sold their home to a brand spanking new congressman from Texas named George Herbert Walker Bush. So George and Barbara, mom and pop, did that sale on a handshake. Sound familiar? Then I came to the Senate in 1978, and soon after that, Ronald Reagan cornered me and asked me to support him for president. And I said I would, not knowing that my friend George would enter the fray. Hearing that, I called and I said, George, I want to tell you I'd love to help, but I've already committed to Ronald Reagan. George's response? Well, Al, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I, Probably should have let you know sooner. And actually, a guy doesn't get very many calls from a friend who says they can't support him. Sound familiar? Of course it does. Because in George Bush's theme of life, during all the highs and lows, there was a simple credo. What would we do without family and friends? And when he became vice president, our friendship, our enjoyable friendship, was refreshed, and the four of us had many, many pleasant times together. And my life in Washington was rather tumultuous. Uh, I went from the A socialist to the Z, <laughs> and never came back to the A. In one dark period, I was feeling awful low, and all my wounds were self-inflicted, all of them. And George called me early one morning, always early in the morning, <laughs> country music playing in the background, and he said, aha, I see the media is shooting you pretty full of holes. Actually, he said it a bit more pungently than that. And he said, why don't we go up to Camp David? You and Ann come over and we'll have a weekend together. At that time, his popularity rating was 93%. Mine was 0.93%. <laughs> and so off we went. The media, of course, all gathered as we headed to Marine One. And George said, now wave to your pals over there in the media, Al. And they didn't wave back. <laughs> so next morning, he's ratting through all the papers in the US. And he looks up and he said, aha, here's the one I've been looking for. A picture of Barbara and Ann and George with his arm and hand on my back. And later, we're having a sauna. And I said, George, I am not unmindful as to what you are doing. You are propping up your old wounded duck pal. While you're at the top of your game, you reach out to me while I'm tangled in rich controversy and taking my lumps. And he said, yep. <laughs> there were staff members, Al, who told me not to do this. But Al, this is about friendship and loyalty. Sound familiar? Well, we had an awful lot of fun, too. Always a delight to be in the president's box at the Kennedy Center, off to a play at the National Theater of the Warner with the Bushes. And outside of the president's box one evening, there was a massive six-foot vase 
but an extraordinary glaze. I hope you know the difference between a vase and a vase. 35 bucks. <laughs> now, George walked up to it and he said, Al, oh, wait, I think that's Etruscan. I noticed that he said this blue-grayish glaze from that period, a clay that could only be found during that era. And I said, no, no, George. The patina there gives me the perception it was possibly older, perhaps of Greek origin, with that particular herbal paste before firing. Of course, people gathered around, mumbling about these expert observers. And Barbara and Ann finally came by and said, get out of here. <laughs> Both of you, get back in that box. Well, we did. Well, it was impressive for a while. And then, of course, one night, the four of us went to see Michael Crawford singing the songs of Andrew Lloyd Webber. All four of us were singing as we went back to the White House. Don't cry for me, Argentina. <laughs> and tidbits from Phantom of the Opera and other magic of Weber. And a few days later, he's getting hammered by the press for some extraordinarily petty bit of trivia. And suddenly he sings out, Don't cry for me, Argentina. <laughs> The press then wrote that he was finally losing his marbles. <laughs> now, these honored guests right here before us who have held this noble post know well of the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. He was a class act from birth to death. He housed the strong sinews in mind and body gained from that extraordinary mother. We compared our mothers as velvet hammers, of course, and certainly most awesome fathers. The history books will and are treating him most fairly while uncovering some other powerful traits, his great competitiveness, his raw courage, and his self-discipline. Recall the Andrews Air Base Conclave where congressional participants drafted a remarkable bill that dealt with two-year budgeting, entitlement reform, comprehensive and catastrophic health care, social security solvency, and much more. But it required a critical ingredient called revenue, translated into the word taxes, translated into the words, read my lips. <laughs> and the group went to George and said, look, we can get this package done, but we must have some revenue. And he said, I'll never forget it. He said, what I've said on that subject sure puts a hell of a lot of heat on me. <laughs> and then they all said, yes, but we can get it done and it will be bipartisan. And George said, okay, go for it, but it will be a real punch in the gut. Bob Dole then, a loyal warrior for George, took it back to the Senate, and we won a very strong bipartisan vote. And went over to the House where his own party turned on him. Surely one of the main factors assuring his return to private life. But he often said, when the really tough choices come, it's the country, not me. It's not about Democrats or Republicans. It's for our country that I fought for. And he was a man of such great humility. Those who travel the high road of humility in Washington, D.C. are not bothered by heavy traffic. <laughs> and. Uh, he had a very serious flaw, known by all close to it. He loved a good joke, the richer the better, and he'd throw his head back and give that great laugh, but he never, ever could remember a punchline. <laughs> and I mean never. So the punchline for George Herbert Walker Bush is this. 
you would have wanted him on your side. He never lost his sense of humor. Humor is the universal solvent against the abrasive elements of life. That's what humor is. He never hated anyone. He knew what his mother and my mother always knew. Hatred corrodes the container it's carried in. The most decent and honorable person I ever met was my friend George Bush, one of nature's noblemen. His epitaph, perhaps just a single letter, the letter L for loyalty. It coursed through his blood, loyalty to his country, loyalty to his family, loyalty to his friends, loyalty to the institutions of government, and always, always, always a friend to his friends. None of us were ready for this day. We mourn his loss from our own lives and what he was to each of us. That is so personal, so intimate, so down inside. It would have been so much easier to celebrate his life with him here, but he is gone, irrevocably gone. So now we have loosed our grip upon him, but we shall always retain his memory in our hearts. God has come now to take him back. We all knew on one unknown day he would return to his God. So now we give him up. We commend him to your loving hands. Thank you for him. God rest his soul. Alan Simpson showing his signature sense of humor. He always remembers the punchlines. And now part of the service planned by the president himself the hymn, Last Full Measure of Devotion, sung by Ronan Tynan. In the long and honored history of America, there are names that shine like beacons in the night. The patriots whose vision gave us meaning, who kept the lamp of freedom burning bright. In the long and honored history of America, there are those who pay the last and final what they gave to the cause, the last full measure of devotion, and though they cannot hear our applause, we honor them forever and keep alive their story, pay tribute to their lives and give Devotion, and they gave their lives to serve the greater need. 
Konentainen. He actually sang to President Bush in his final hours, Silent Night, the President Mao DeLong. And now, the 43rd President of the United States will honor the 41st, his father. Distinguished guests, including our presidents and first ladies, government officials, foreign dignitaries, and friends. Jeb, Neil, Marvin, Darrow, and I, and our families, thank you all for being here. I once heard it said of man that the idea is to die young as late as possible. At age 85, a favorite pastime of George H.W. Bush was firing up his boat, the Fidelity, and opening up the three 300 horsepower engines to fly, joyfully fly, across the Atlantic with the Secret Service boats straining to keep up. At age 90, George H.W. Bush parachuted out of an aircraft and landed on the grounds of St. Anne's by the Sea in Kennebunkport, Maine, the church where his mom was married and where he worshiped often. Mother liked to say he chose the location just in case the chute didn't open. <laughs> in his 90s, he took great delight when his closest pal, James A. Baker, smuggled a bottle of Grey Goose vodka into his hospital room. Apparently it paired well with the steak Baker had delivered from Morton's. <laughs> to his very last days, Dad's life was instructive. As he aged, he taught us how to grow with dignity, humor, and kindness. And when the good Lord finally called, how to meet him with courage and with the joy of the promise of what lies ahead. One reason Dad knew how to die young is that he almost did it, twice. When he was a teenager, a staph infection nearly took his life. A few years later, he was alone in the Pacific on a life raft, praying that his rescuers would find him before the enemy did. God answered those prayers. It turned out he had other plans for George H.W. Bush. For Dad's part, I think those brushes with death made him cherish the gift of life, and he vowed to live every day to the fullest. Dad was always busy, a man in constant motion, but never too busy to share his love of life with those around him. He taught us to love the outdoors. He loved watching dogs flush a covey. He loved landing the elusive striper and once confined to a wheelchair, he seemed happiest sitting in his favorite perch on the back porch at Walker's Point, contemplating the majesty of the Atlantic. The horizons he saw were bright and hopeful. He was a genuinely optimistic man, and that optimism guided his children and made each of us believe that anything was possible. He continually broadened his horizons with daring decisions. He was a patriot. After high school, he put college on hold and became a Navy fighter pilot as World War II broke out. Like many of his generation, he never talked about his service until his time as a public figure forced his hand. We learned of the attack on Chichijima, the mission completed, the shoot down. We learned of the death of his crewmates, whom he thought about throughout his entire life. And we learned of the rescue. And then another audacious decision. He moved his young family from the comforts of the East Coast to Odessa, Texas. He and mom adjusted to their arid surroundings quickly. He was a tolerant man. After all, he was kind and neighborly to the women with whom he, mom, and I shared a bathroom in our small duplex. Even after he learned their profession, 
ladies of the night. <laughs> Dad could relate to people from all walks of life. He was an empathetic man. He valued character over pedigree, and he was no cynic. He looked for the good in each person, and he usually found it. Dad taught us that public service is noble and necessary, that one can serve with integrity and hold true to the important values like faith and family. He strongly believed that it was important to give back to the community and country in which one lived. He recognized that serving others enriched the giver's soul. To us, his was the brightest of a thousand points of light. In victory, he shared credit. When he lost, he shouldered the blame. He accepted that failure is a part of living a full life, but taught us never to be defined by failure. He showed us how setbacks can strengthen. None of his disappointments could compare with one of life's greatest tragedies, the loss of a young child. Jeb and I were too young to remember the pain and agony he and mom felt when our three-year-old sister died. We only learned later that dad, a man of quiet faith, prayed for her daily. He was sustained by the love of the Almighty and the real and enduring love of her mom. Dad always believed that one day he would hug his precious Robin again. He loved to laugh, especially at himself. He could tease and needle, but never out of malice. He placed great value on a good joke. That's why he chose Simpson to speak. <laughs> On email, he had a circle of friends with whom he shared or received the latest jokes. His grading system for the quality of the joke was classic George Bush. The rare sevens and eights were considered huge winners, most of them off color. George Bush knew how to be a true and loyal friend. He nurtured and honored many, his many friendships with a generous and giving soul. There exist thousands of handwritten notes encouraging or sympathizing or thanking his friends and acquaintances. He had an enormous capacity to give of himself. Many a person would tell you that dad became a mentor and a father figure in their life. He listened and he consoled. He was their friend. I think of Don Rhodes, Taylor Blanton, Jim Nance, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and perhaps the unlikeliest of all, the man who defeated him, Bill Clinton. My siblings and I refer to the guys in this group as brothers from other mothers. <laughs> he taught us that a day was not meant to be wasted. He played golf at a legendary pace. I always wonder why he insisted on speed golf. He was a good golfer. Well, here's my conclusion. He played fast so that he could move on to the next event, to enjoy the rest of the day, to expend his enormous energy, to live it all. He was born with just two settings, full throttle, then sleep. <laughs> he taught us what it means to be a wonderful father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. He was firm in his principles and supportive as we began to seek our own ways. He encouraged and comforted, but never steered. We tested his patience. I know I did. <laughs> but he always responded with the great gift of unconditional love. Last Friday, when I was told he had minutes to live, I called him. The guy answered the phone, said he, I think he can hear you, but he hadn't said anything for most of the day. I said, Dad, I love you and you've been a wonderful father. And the last words he would ever say on earth were, I love you too. To us, he was close to perfect, but not totally perfect. His short game was lousy. <laughs> 
He wasn't exactly Fred Astaire on the dance floor. The man couldn't stomach vegetables, especially broccoli. And by the way, he passed these genetic defects along to us. <laughs> Finally, every day of his 73 years of marriage, Dad taught us all what it means to be a great husband. He married his sweetheart. He adored her. He laughed and cried with her. He was dedicated to her totally. In his old age, Dad enjoyed watching police show reruns, the volume on high all the while holding mom's hand. After mom died, dad was strong, but all he really wanted to do was hold mom's hand again. Of course, dad taught me another special lesson. He showed me what it means to be a president who serves with integrity, leads with courage, and acts with love in his heart for the citizens of our country. When the history books are written, they will say that George H.W. Bush was a great president of the United States, a diplomat of unmatched skill, a commander-in-chief of formidable accomplishment, and a gentleman who executed the duties of his office with dignity and honor. In his inaugural address, the 41st president of the United States said this, we cannot hope only to leave our children a bigger car, a bigger bank account. We must hope to give them a sense of what it means to be a loyal friend, a loving parent, a citizen who leaves his home, his neighborhood, and town better than he found it. What do we want the men and women who work with us to say when we are no longer there? That we were more driven to succeed than anyone around us, or that we stopped to ask if a sick child had gotten better and stayed a moment there to trade a word of friendship. Well, Dad, we're going to remember you for exactly that and much more. And we're going to miss you. Your decency, sincerity, and kind soul will stay with us forever. So through our tears, let us know the blessings of knowing and loving you, a great and noble man, the best father a son or daughter could have. And in our grief, let us smile knowing that Dad is hugging Robin and holding mom's hand again. Well, he almost made it. George W. Bush speaking of his father and fellow president. Remember the man whose last words were, I love you, to him.
Exactly, Stan. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Bow your heads in prayer, please. Almighty God of all comfort, console us of all light strengthen us, of all love inspire us to love you and to love those you send our way. Amen. Well, please be seated. It is a tremendous honor to follow these speakers and especially someone whom I admire so much, our 43rd president, sir. Your uh, father always welcomed my visits and never made me feel rushed and always said thank you for coming. Never made me feel like I was going on too long. Your mother... <coughs> <laughs> usually said, good sermon, too long. Um, I got your email. <clears throat> You're a lot like your mother. Um, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, children of God, when death comes as it does to us all, life is changed, not ended. And the way we live our lives, the decisions we make, the service we render matter. They matter to our fellow human beings, to this world that God has given to us, and they matter to God. And few people have understood this as well or lived their lives as accordingly as President George Herbert Walker Bush. Now hear what I said, lived it, not earned it or strived to achieve it. It was as natural to him as breathing is to each of us. President Bush was a good man, a decent man, a godly man, full of grace and love and equality of absolute necessity to enter the kingdom of God, humility, grounded in a desire to serve his God and all God sent his way. How do I know this? Because for nearly a dozen years, uh, my wife, Laura, and our children and I, we have laughed with him, we have fished with him. President Bush brought up riding in fidelity we had that pleasure as well. The Secret Service was behind us. He was at full throttle. I saw many of them reaching for what I thought were protective armor, but then I realized as they followed the president, they were actually crossing themselves. <clears throat> We've been blessed to share meals and tears and moments of silence and prayers in times of great strength and times of great weakness. Never. Not once did I witness anything but care and concern for those around him. The job of a pastor, a priest, an imam, a rabbi, when dealing with someone he or she is called to serve, is to call on them to look to God, to do the right thing, to serve others, and to love. And President Bush made my job so easy. Our lesson from the Hebrew Scriptures remind us that God is light, and the President reflected that light his whole life through. He once said, I'm a man who sees life in terms of missions defined and missions completed. And we recall with delight when he reminded America and her citizens of his mission and ours to be points of light with but one aim, 
to leave our world better than we found it. I have a, a political cartoon of the 41st president. I keep it in my desk with caricatured big ears. He's uh, sitting at his desk, he's looking at his watch, and he's saying to himself, communism is dead, the wall is down, apartheid is falling, Mandela is free, the Sandinistas are ousted, Germany is reuniting, the Cold War is over, I've returned my calls, and heck, it's not even lunchtime. <laughs> we sometimes forget all that President Bush did for us, in large part because he preferred to shine not upon himself, but to shine to others. Several years ago, President Bush gave me this uh, plaque. And on the back's a note, Russ, a good friend gave this to me some years ago. It may be of help to you in some way. It reads simply, preach Christ at all times. If necessary, use words. It remains on my desk as a reminder that faith means more than words. Jesus Christ, for George Bush, was at the heart of his faith. But his was a deep faith, a generous faith, a simple faith in the best sense of the word. He knew and lived Jesus' two greatest commandments to love God and to love your neighbor. The president loved and served not just some, but all that God sent his way. He lived his own adage that tolerance is a virtue, not a vice. He respected and befriended Christians of every denomination, as well as Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and Sikhs. His comrades were from every nation and race. Yes, he was a Republican, but for him, political parties were but a line in the sand to brush away in times of the greater good of working toward his goal for all of us to be that kinder and gentler nation. The gospel that Dean Haworth just read for us a moment ago reminds us that Jesus told his followers to be the light of the world so that the world could turn their hearts toward God and toward others. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. And so was President Bush. His life was defined by his faith and his service that are worthy of all those made in God's image. In September of 1990, President Bush spoke to those gathered outside those doors for the dedication of this great cathedral. And he pointed inside to that magnificent rose window right there from the outside, and he spoke these words, from where we now stand, the rose window high above seems black and formless to some, perhaps, but when we enter, we see it backlit by the sun. It dazzles in astonishing splendor and reminds us that without faith, we too are but stained glass windows in the dark. The president understood that even in the darkest of nights, things can be transformed if handed over to the redemptive power of the Almighty. No one on that first Good Friday expected Easter Sunday, but it came. It came because the light that brought creation into being also brought life from the grave. We call that resurrection. Only days ago, I was humbled, along with members of the president's staff, his outstanding and loyal medical team, so many friends, Sully, who I believe has gotten more press than the president in the last few days. <laughs> Loving members of his family who called in, who spoke with him throughout the day, and as our 43rd president just said, inspired his last words, words of love. Sitting with us was someone the president liked to call his little brother, James Baker, and his wife, Susan. As I said, there have been wonderful hugs and kind words throughout the day, kisses throughout the day. Toward the end, Secretary Baker and I were sitting on the sofa next to one another a few steps away, and he whispered to me, you know, that man changed my life. A bit later, Secretary Baker was at the foot of the President's bed. And toward the end, Jim Baker rubbed and stroked the President's feet for perhaps half an hour. 
The President smiled at the comfort of his dear friend. Here I witnessed a world leader who was serving a servant who had been our world's leader. And what came to mind was Jesus. On that last night before his own crucifixion, having said everything there was to say, he wrapped a towel around his waist and without words, he washed his disciples' feet. As Jesus finished, he said, I've set an example for you. Do as I have done, serve one another. By this, the world will know you're my disciples if you serve and if you love one another. At the end, we all knelt. We all placed our hands on the president. We said our prayers together. And then we were silent for a full, long measure as this man who changed all of our lives, who changed our nation, who changed our world, left this life for the next. It was a beautiful end. It was a beautiful beginning. For a moment, but a moment only, that dear point of light we know as George Herbert Walker Bush dimmed, but it now shines brighter than it ever before has. And now this godly man, this servant, this child of God is in the loving arms of Barbara and Robin and the welcoming arms of our Lord who embraced him with his divine love. Some have said in the last few days, this is an end of an era, but it does not have to be. Perhaps it's an invitation to fill the hole that has been left behind. The president so loved his church, he loved the Episcopal church, he so loved our great nation, he so loved you, his friends, he so loved every member of his family, but he was so ready to go to heaven, and heaven was so ready to receive him because he lived those two great commandments. If you want to honor him, and if you call yourself a daughter or a son of God, then love God, love your neighbor. There's no greater mission on planet Earth. My hunch is heaven as perfect as it must be, just got a bit kinder and gentler, leaving behind that hole for you and me to fill. How? Preach Christ at all times. If necessary, use words. So Mr. President, mission complete. Well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome to your eternal home, where ceiling and visibility are unlimited, and life goes on forever. Amen. President's final pastor, Reverend Dr. Russell Levinson. And now we'll hear from Michael Smith.
with the chapter in your life is through. But we'll keep you close. It won't even see you gone Cause our hearts in big and small things Will keep the love that keeps us strong It's hard to let you go In the Father's hands we know That a lifetime's not too long To live as friends With the faith and love God's given Springing from the hope We know In the assurance of eternal life given at baptism, let us proclaim our faith and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
For our brother George, let us play, pray to our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for George and dry the tears of those who weep. Hear us, Lord. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. You raised the dead to life. Give to our brother your eternal life. You promised paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our brother to the joys of heaven. Our brother was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give him fellowship with all your saints. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our brother. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Father of all, we pray to you for George and for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May his soul and the souls of all the departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen.
Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints. Where For sorrow and pain are no more, neither sign but life everlasting. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of mankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Saints, for sorrow and pain and no more, for sign of life and last. Into your hands, O oh, merciful Savior, we commend your servant George. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive George into the arms of your mercy into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be on you and remain with you in this world in which we live, this day and forevermore. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.
honor guard again in place for President Bush.
And so ends the state funeral of America's 41st president. As we see the 43rd, George W. Bush with his wife, Laura, Major General Howard heading to the motorcade, which will now make its way to Andrews Air Force Base, where Air Force One, now renamed Special Air Mission 41, is waiting for the family. George H.W. Bush will be taken home to Texas, College Station, Texas, Texas A&M, for his final resting place next to his wife, Barbara, daughter, Robin. John Meacham said at the beginning of the ceremony that this was a story that was almost over ever before it was begun. But what a story that was told today about President George H.W. Bush. We learned about a patriot, a fighter, a father, a friend, a man of faith, a man who loved fun, and we learned about a president. David Muir, a fitting tribute. No question, George. I think the 43rd president did this nation a proud today in honoring the 41st president, and while doing so, uh, likely made his father proud. You know, we had heard the story about those final hours in Houston, uh, that his father was fading, that he hadn't spoken in some time, and they made phone calls to the children, George W. Bush being the last phone call. Uh, he was able to talk with his father. He'd been warned that his father uh, hadn't been alert, hadn't been talking, and he told him, you've been a wonderful father, I love you. And he described here in the cathedral today how his father then spoke for the final time, saying, I love you too. But you know, George, as you were listening, I'm sure you heard it too, that trademark uh, humor and humility this Bush family is known so well for. He went down the list of some of the things that his father wasn't good at, his short game, uh, eating vegetables. Uh, one of the things he talked about in his father's later years was listening to the old police shows with the volume all the way up. But then he added he would do that while holding Barbara's hand. And he said that in these last few months, his father had been so strong, but that they all knew in the family that he simply wanted to hold Barbara's hand again. Yeah, it was it was magnificent. David Muir, thanks very much. And, and Koki, you noticed it as well. We know how hard George W. was trying today, uh, but could not quite make it. Because he end. got he got to the line where he was the best father ever. And that's when he just couldn't quite hold it together. And who could? I mean, it is really, really hard to do that. But what a beautiful service. What a tribute. And as we've talked about before, we know George H.W. Bush planned it himself and knew uh, what he wanted to have said and who he wanted to have say it. Uh, but there were so many echoes here and, and important lessons. I thought actually one of the best was from Alan Simpson, who's always funny, but he had a he had a very good line, which hatred corrodes the container it's carried in. And that's a very good message for Washington today. And humor is the solvent that that's right. corrodes the <laughs> hatred <laughs> as well. Terry Moran, so many touching human moments across uh, that ceremony, not only in the speeches, but I was struck by that moment between Jeb and George right. W. Uh, when they were talking about how their father was always there to raise them up at difficult times. And you could see the two brothers nodding. That, that's him. That's him. That's who it was. I felt lucky to be watching this right. in a way because while we are commemorating a president and recognizing his achievements, look, there are many ways to be remembered in life. But the way this man was just commemorated as a good man, that's the best way. A good man, but not a saint. I remember John <laughs> Meacham's line, to preside he had to prevail. He was an imperfect man, Mark Upton Grove, who left us a more perfect union. A reminder again that George Bush could be tough in politics, had his faults, but in the end was always had his eye on doing the right thing. He led with his values. It was interesting when John also talked about the fact that uh, that, that, that harrowing moment for young George H.W. Bush on that yellow rubber life raft in the middle of the Pacific, not knowing if he would be rescued. He was, of course, but once he was rescued, he spent time on the USS Finback, the submarine that had plucked him out of the Pacific, and he wondered if, if his life had been spared for some kind of destiny on Earth, and we heard today the fruition of that destiny. Yeah, why he was saved. Donna Brazil, we learn a lot this morning about a man of faith. A man of tremendous faith, a man of courage, a man of dignity, and I will take from this celebration of his life the words from his, his pastor, Reverend Russell Jones Levinson, who said, 
Some have said this is an end of an era, but it doesn't have to be. Perhaps this is an invitation to fill the void that has been left behind. He leaves big shoes and work that still must be done. There's no question about that, Martha Raddatz. I, I, I keep thinking about the stories about him parachuting at age 90 <laughs> yeah. and what that meant to him and how he talked about how much fun that was. But think about it, when he was a 20-year-old, bailing out of that airplane with a parachute that saved his life, that eventually would have this magnificent, beautiful service. You know, a when big, vibrant heart uh, is what John Meacham said. When that story was first told, the camera happened to be on that front row where all the other presidents were. And remember, the only other uh, person who fought of those presidents, of course, is Jimmy Carter. And you wonder, Michael Duff, you've written about these presidents, you wonder what is going through the mind of all those people who held the same office one day, they will be in this same position hearing their predecessor remembered. You know, they have to be asking themselves, will I be held, will I measure up? Uh, this is quite a moment and quite a standard. You know, a state funeral is a curious mashup. It's a, a sacred celebration of a remarkable life, but also a secular and kind of solemn reminder that this is an office like no other on the planet. Uh, and we have to honor that office and the men, so far only men, uh, who serve there. So for the for the members of this particular fraternity, um, they are watching what happened today and thinking, I hope I've spent my presidency and post-presidential years as uh, wisely as George Bush did. The motorcade now pulling away. John Carl, you cover this current, current White House. You're our chief White House correspondent. Of course, our eyes also today on President Trump as he watched that ceremony uh, as well in his interaction with the other presidents. You saw a lot of uh, jovial interactions among the former presidents before the current president took his seat. Uh, none, none of that afterwards. There was, um, you know, he sat there, the, the Trumps right next to the Obamas. Uh, very little interaction, a, a real chill uh, when, when they sat down. But this president, uh, the current president, um, has done everything uh, that he could do. Uh, to make this a special uh, a ceremony, a, a, a remembrance of the 41st president. He has, uh, you know, d f from lending Air Force One uh, to, to staying in the background and to allow this entire week to be a celebration of George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, I, 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 George, I also, uh, looking at that speech from the 43rd president, uh, George W. Bush, um, I was thinking back to the speech that he gave three days after 9-11, arguably the greatest speech of his presidency. And of course, his father was there with him as you know, when he gave that speech. And before he went up to give it, as you recall, that, that great moment where he reached over to his son, put his hand on his hand, just as a moment of reassurance. Um, and, and, and this was another great, great speech, I thought, by George W. Bush. Boy, just seeing that picture again, it brings a tear to your eye immediately. Just the way the father reached out, Kofi, and just to, didn't even have to look. Didn't just have found to look that because, hand. Because that, in the end, is who he was. He was a dad. Mm -hmm. And he was a dad to those, those five children and to the country. And that's how we're remembering him, as a, as a father figure who truly loved the citizens of this country and citizenship as an important element of all of our lives. And you saw the pain and the pride on those families' faces today. President Bush now going home, going home to the home he chose, the state of Texas. He is heading out on Special Air Mission 41. We'll fly to College Station. More ceremonies tomorrow, the final farewell in College Station tomorrow. There you see Air Force One getting ready now to meet the former president, take him home. This will be his last few moments in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. We're signing off for now. Have a good day. And in our grief, I just smile knowing that Dad is hugging Robin and holding Mom's hand again. This has been a special report from ABC News. We now
now join our programming in progress. I'm directing a movie. It's like he's directing a small country. Yeah. Like the thing is so massive. And I sat there for a week and watched the scene, two scenes get filmed. One of them was absolutely amazing. I heard plot details and stuff. Movies could be fantastic. So I got to watch somebody else direct. Normally, I, like I'm a director, I got to watch quality direct. So I walked away learning a thing or two from JJ, man. Like, That's so I actually awesome. think we go make a new movie in, uh, in the new year. We're making a sequel to Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back called oh. Jay and Silent Bob Reboot. Yes, thank you. So I'm ready, man. Having just come off the Star Wars set, I'm ready to put all that to, to you know, work. Now, granted, he's got a zillion dollar budget and we have like eight. So uh, it'll be a smaller production. But you know what? It still will be watched by a lot of people. That's okay. all that matters, yeah. my Fingers friend. Fingers crossed, man. Fingers crossed. And I think I'll be a better director. If you'd like, I could actually put my directing skills. Yeah, do it to you right the here. Test. Oh my God. Take us out and segment. stuff. I've, I've never oh directed live TV. Do How do many it, cameras we got? Four? Whoa. What's my, Just, what's, uh, all right. Camera four is mine, but we got a steady cam here. Can I get a dramatic push in on this? Hold on, not yet, but oh wait. Gosh, what do I got to tease? What's coming y next? Yourself. Yourself. Oh. <laughs> I do that all the time, especially <laughs> lately. All right, here we go. <laughs> Come in close at me. Ready? And action. But oh, you know what? Dramatic I forgot to push. say. I forgot to say speed. Come in fast. <laughs> that would be help. Here we go. And action. Kept, that's a zoom. Come at me. Come Just walk at me. Walk yeah. in. It's like that. Yes. All right. Go back and we'll do it again. Here we go. And action. Kevin Smith's comedy special, Silent of the Deadly, is available now on digital platforms and on demand. Coming up later from the golden era of hip hop, the MCs of Top Shelf 1988 are going to perform right here on GMAD. Come on back. Philadelphia cream cheese, made with fresh milk and real cream, makes your recipes their holiday favorites. The holidays are made with Philly. George woke up in pain, but he has plans today. So he took a leave. If he'd taken Tylenol, he'd be stopping for more pills right now. Only Aleve has the strength to stop tough pain for up to 12 hours with just one pill. Aleve, all day strong. Are you taking the tissue test? Yep, and my teeth are yellow. Time for white strips. Crest Glamorous White White Strips are the only ADA-accepted whitening strips proven to be safe and effective, and they whiten 25 times better than a leading whitening toothpaste. Crest, healthy, beautiful smiles for life. I've never been able to match a pair of socks, which is ironic because my name is Melissa Match. So designing my living room? Yeah, right. Fortunately, Urban Attitudes by Lazy Boy is a collection of affordable, distinctly styled pieces that mix together perfectly. So perfectly, I couldn't mismatch them if I tried. Come in for incredible savings throughout the store. Urban Attitudes by Lazy Boy. Live life comfortably. Listen, moms, Hot Pockets are exactly what hungry kids want in a snack. Premium pepperoni, real cheese, and that buttery garlic crust. They're literally stuffed full of deliciousness. Nothing satisfies like 100% real cheese and 10 grams of protein. Hot Pockets! Tonight. You want a little secret? Stop. 
life's little questions. How do you not have a proper toolbox? Get more complicated. I've been working so hard to make partner. How do I take it knowing you'll pull me away from Theo? And they all lead back to their best friend. Is there a side to John that we didn't know? Was he having financial trouble? Oh my God. I think he was having an affair? A Million Little Things, new tonight on ABC. On your marks? Get set. Bake. Tomorrow, from the creators of the hit series, The Great British Bake Off. What is that? Comes the sweetest show of the holidays. Yum. Ten bakers. Don't mess it up. It's just a cookie. Some will rise. Perfect. Some will fall. I think I've lost a tooth. With one added spice. This is so exciting. Host Baby Spice joins Spice Adams. I don't like that. I love it. The Great American Baking Show Holiday Edition premieres tomorrow on ABC. Joy, laughter, memories, and rockin' good music. It's finally here. CMA Country Christmas. With performances by Brad Paisley, Brett Eldridge, Martina McBride, Dan and Shay, Old Dominion, Brett Young, Lindsey Sterling, Dustin Lynch, Michael W. Smith, and Amy Grant. And a special duet by Diana Krall and the legendary Tony Bennett. Thank you. Plus, it's hosted by me, Reba McIntyre. Baby, let it snow. CMA Country Christmas, Monday, part of 25 Days of Christmas on ABC. In the 80s, she was a student. In the 90s... I'm the new music teacher. I'm an adult now. You're wearing two different shoes. Shut up, nerd! From producers of The Goldbergs... Pretty sweet. The teachers eat for free. Teachers do not eat for free. You've just been grabbing food without paying? No. You still don't have the right You can't kick me out of school. Yes, I can, I think. A new school comedy... Is this how you mosh? ...with old school friends. You're a teacher now. Act like it. Mm -hmm. School series premiere Wednesday, January 9th on ABC. Oh, son of a...